Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our next law enforcement briefing. In today's webinar, we'll be taking a look at video analytics with Bedrock's senior te technical architect, Michael Crabtree. Don't feel like you need to take notes or take it all in straight away, as we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar to everyone who registered. Also, if you have any questions, please do feel free to drop those into the Q&A box at the side at any time. And we'll also have a little bit of time for questions at the end. Let's take a look at the agenda for today. So we'll be starting with an overview of analytics that can be incorporated into live camera feeds. We'll be looking at post process video analytics. There'll be some discussion around how video, video analytics software can be used to derive operational intelligence. There will be some real world case studies Bedrock clients have used um, for this technology and to increase public safety and optimise the operations. Finally, we'll be taking a look at what's next and letting you know when the next one of these briefings will happen. So an introduction for those of you who may not be familiar with Bedrock, I'll do a quick introduction before handing over to Michael. Bedrock help organisations that rely on technology for critical operations. Bedrock have delivered projects for almost every police force and law enforcement agency in the UK, providing secure, resilient networks, networks and managed IT solutions. With years of experience with law enforcement, we understand the pressures teams are working under and our detailed planning and testing ensures that we're implementing the right technology that works first time. <clears throat> I've added in two boxes here, prevent and reduce crime and build public trust and confidence, because I know that phrases like this will look familiar to you all from the policing plans handed down from the PCCs and chief constables. It's our job as your partner to help you implement the right technology that can help you to achieve your targets as efficiently as possible. We'll cover how the technology we're talking about today can fit in with these targets. We're also proud to partner with market leading vendors to help you get the kit you need. I've added some of their logos below. I'll now hand over to Michael to talk you through an overview of video analytics. Good morning uh, and welcome to this quarter's law enforcement briefing. Uh, thank you, Jenny, for the introduction. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the last webinar. Um, today, we're going to be talking about video analytics and how it can benefit you, help you meet or exceed your operational requirements uh, and how help we can help you make the best use of them. Um, so it's absolutely critical for law enforcement to be able to effectively and efficiently review, respond to events recorded by video surveillance. Uh, many hours of police time is often used uh, manually viewing, processing of potentially thousands of hours uh, of footage. Uh, with the new generation of advanced analytics, we can take analytics from simple motion detection, which uh, even if people just have some CCTV at home may be aware of that, uh, to the identification and characterization of objects, including metadata such as colors uh, of clothing, vehicles, those types of things the heights and sizes of, of, of vehicles uh, and other objects, speeds that maybe some of those vehicles are going at, uh, the density of objects and people in a space and quite a lot more. Uh, and, and obviously the idea here is, is to make sure that we can reduce things like false alarms, which would make uh, certain things such as motion detection on its own very difficult or impossible to use in a professional environment. So let's have a look at two types of analytics. One of them is live uh, and the other one is post-processed analytics. So some of the operational requirements around live analytics would be to be alerted when a person enters or leaves an area or a building coming in and out of a door, that type of thing, uh, and be alerted when, as I say, vehicles uh, leave or come onto a driveway, come off a driveway, those types of things. Um, in terms of post-processing, then uh, we've got the ability to locate uh, and also monitor the movement of a missing person or suspect uh, and also understanding the movement of a vehicle or something like that over a time period across multiple locations and multiple cameras. Um, if we have a look at some of the, the, the pros and cons and, and why you would use one over another and that type of thing, uh, live analytics can often be integrated into existing cameras there's possibly cameras you've got right now that already have that functionality that you could be making use of. Uh, they can often be quite quick 
to initially set up and get working. Although we'll talk a little bit about that later because it'll have taken a short amount of time uh, to tweak certain things such as weather conditions, time of day to make sure you're getting reliability over time. And as I just said, it can, it, you know, one of those things, it can take a small number of days sometimes to tweak the setup. Um, I normally say two days, two nights. Depends on the weather. You might have to come back if it, you know, if it was dry over that period and suddenly it's raining and, and things are going off again. But you can certainly tweak that setup and get it running reliably, relatively efficiently. Um, and obviously, if you if you cross reference in different sources, that still takes you as the person to do that. Um, so it's great for that kind of initial alerting. Some of the things to do with post processing, it can save huge amounts of time and effort in manually playing back hours of footage from multiple cameras. Um, it can also, in some respects, be able to do the collation and the presentation, that information, giving the operators an insight that they just wouldn't maybe see otherwise, maybe something they'd miss um, by not having that available to them as a, as a single thing. Um, it also can take uh, more hardware because it's often separate hardware, um, and it can take time for that hardware to process the data. But um, we, uh, we've created a tool that calculates that time. So we can look at how the amount of hours of footage you would want to be able to process. And, you know, in an ideal world, how long would you want that to take to process it? And we can come up with a, a hardware specification that would fit. And it would then be able to uh, process that data and make that data ready for you, for you to search. So let's have a look at live video analytics. As we said before, it can be used in for alerting and alarming, and it can be used for things such as perimeter protection. It can be for objects leaving or entering an area, objects stopping or loitering in areas. It can also be used for things passing, say, things like virtual tripwires. Um, and we can also do things such as direction violation. There's, a, there's around about 50 in total uh, of different types of things that can be done live uh, against some video. Uh, a couple of examples there on the screen. We can see that the uh, software in question here is is identifying a vehicle and also is identifying people as well and pedestrians walking through that space. Uh, that's one of our clients that we we look after. Um, this is where we can do lots of things such as people counting, crowd density, um, Great for things as well, such as um, they call it museum mode, which works in two ways. Uh, one of them is leaving a suitcase or a bag um, in a position. So things like bomb protection, that type of thing. If something suddenly appears and sits there for a while by itself, it could be something to investigate. And also the other way around. So uh, you may have a box around a vehicle and you want to know when that box, uh, when that vehicle leaves. That can also be achieved as well in live analytics. They're usually derived from the camera itself, so the camera really is, is required to 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 uh, do analytics itself. Most modern cameras, you know, do that from such people as Axis and various others. Uh, I've got two two different manufacturers here. I think one's individual on the others and Axis. Um, so that's done in camera. So the intelligence is in that and it allows it to do that processing far quicker by itself and add that metadata into the video feed that can then be used by whichever video management system you're going to be using. Uh, we can see the one on the left. We've got vehicle enter and exit. We've got objects crossing beam. So uh, anything that comes in and just goes over that line. We're going to look a bit more into some of these as we look at operational requirements. Um, so the idea here is that they will pass through that beam and then that will generate some kind of alert. And then the one on the right, uh, I'm going to talk about a bit more as well because that was a very specific requirement for a very, uh, very you know, interesting operation. Let's call it that. We'll go into more detail shortly on that. So a couple of things about the cameras. Uh, while analytics can be used on PTZ cameras, um, it is often only in a home position, which means if all it takes is an operator to move it slightly out of home, the system now says the camera's not in home position and it stops doing analytics. So it's it's not that we're saying you can't do it on PTZ cameras, but you've got to be, you know, you've got to really understand and work out whether or not you absolutely have to. Um, so we always recommend that static cameras be used if possible. Ensuring that the resolution of the camera is high enough to support the type of analytics being used. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide a little bit more because that's really important as well. Ensuring the camera is set at an appropriate height. 
in the main around about 2.8 to 4 meters is is not too bad for appearance search type uh, analytics really um so that if it's not if it's too high obviously you get a lot of tops of heads which means certain things you try to categorize become a bit more difficult if it's too low you get a lot of things like street furniture other objects and those types of things getting in the way um, and the tilt is also important alongside that. So 30 to 45 degrees of tilt is great for object analytics, appearance searches, those types of things. Um, usually 10 to 15 degrees for full facial recognition, but if it's a little bit higher, it can be dealt with most of the time. Uh, ensuring the sufficient light, but also avoiding direct light because you can obviously dazzle the lens and, and cause a few problems with that way. You can see we've got a few examples of view cameras on the right there. Um, one that's probably most interesting to you guys is that axis pinhole just there. Uh, yes, that has analytics built in. It has a lot of the analytics that the big ones do, which is fantastic. Um, and you can basically switch that on and get using that pretty much straight away for those people that do have those. Uh, we've got a couple of others aware there as well. We've got a 360 camera, which are in our use case, which we're going to look at a bit later. Uh, I'll show you where we use those. Um, and then there's another one as well, which is a standard static camera. Um, which has a lot of great analytics as well. So as I said, understanding that resolution is really important uh, for analytics to function. Um, the resolution generally is, is, is known as the pixels per meter for a given distance. So it's not about just about the resolution of the camera, it's the resolution of the image at a distance. The minimum pixels per meter that we need for object analytics is around about 24 pixels per meter. Um, if you do anything higher than that, um, more advanced analytics such as appearance search is 72 pixels per meter. Um, if you're going to be doing facial recognition, it's a lot higher. It's going to be nearer 236 pixels per meter, around about 40 pixels for the width of a face. You can just see on the right hand side there, uh, we've got some uh, calculations uh, which are quite not you know, quite simple to do with these. We just put what kind of height we're mounting the camera at, the target height, in this case 1.83 meters which is kind of like human height really give or take um the target distance i've just put in around 127 meters um the other bit just calculates by itself based on the width of the lens um it's ticked to say i want to do classified object but, um, detection and it's telling me that about 127 meter range that uh, the pixels on target are 24 pixels per meter which is meets that minimum requirement for uh for classified objects. And you can see there it's got a nice blue looking uh, arc to it, which is everything within that bit is fine and should work. Uh, anything outbound of that uh, may have problems. And we can see there that the closest range, so within the first 30 meters of that 130, is where we will probably be able to do facial recognition. Um, and then right out to around about the first 50 meters ish is where we will do uh, appearance search and then outbound of that is where we do the object analytics. So that gives us an idea of the distances and what we can expect the system to be able to cope with with that camera. So we're going to delve a bit more into some detail on those two images I showed you earlier um, in terms of life analytics and objects in an area. The operational requirement for this one was the customer would have liked to have been alerted when there's a person just in the area. Uh, some key points in terms of configuring the cameras, region of interest, probably the most important um, because there's no point in alerting on things that are not within the boundary of that fence. So you can see they've got a nice region of interest in green uh, and we've also set the objects to both people and vehicles. Um, if we know that only pedestrians are going to be in an area, we can just set it to people and that will help it be able to uh, deal with people quicker because we can, again, you know, these things only have so much capacity, so they're going to deal with so much happening at once. So if we tell it not to look for vehicles, it will allow it to basically uh, categorise more people. Um, number of objects is set to one, so we want anybody, anything, any car coming in here, then we need to know about it. How long the object is in the, uh, in the area, which is quite important. If we've got certain things, um, it, don't get wrong, it'll categorise things out such as spiders and flies and certain other things that happen to batter around these things at night with the IR. But um, we do, we, you know, making sure that 
the if, if it, threshold time here is only three seconds actually so uh, the, a person or a thing is going to be in here for an amount of time before it sets off an alarm uh, and the timeout before it's reset that's to stop the same person setting off the alarm every few seconds um, with this one so that's great if we have a look at the same area and have a look at that line that you showed you in the previous images um, for this one this was to be used during the day and the customer wanted to be alerted when any vehicles or people entered through the main gate. Um, before they electrified the gate, the gate stayed open all day so people could come in and out. So what they wanted was for us to be able to be alert, them to be alerted if any vehicles or people entered through that gate. So we set up a virtual tripwire. In this case, they call it uh, an objects crossing beam, but uh, it's given different names depending on the software or the camera you're using. Again, there's no region of interest on here. It's anything that crosses that boundary. Um, number of objects is still one. And again, we've still got a timeout. So anything that crosses that boundary will create an alert. When it comes to alerting, it's OK that the camera is doing these things, but the alerts and the way that the people sat there or in some cases not sat there, they may be doing some other work, um, get alerted to things. So this is just an example of. Which one's this one? Oh yeah, uh, this is the way the area. So we have to set up the alert. Um, this is using a vigil on, so there's a reason why we do it this way, which is set up an alert, then set a rule against that alert. Um, so we set up the alert, that will be doing that 24 seven. What we do then is we set up a rule, um, which is when the analytics are triggered, they want to display an on-screen message um, to the administrator in this case. That's because uh, that allows us as part of testing to see that that's working. Um, what they also want to do is they want to send an email to with mess with images uh, to to a uh, control center. I've grayed out the email address obviously for GDPR purposes. Um, now because this only wants to work at night, uh, we had to do something quite clever, which is it put a digital input onto the system so we can do that with rules. So basically they've got a little button. They push the button when they leave like you would uh, uh, an alarm on a building and that essentially sets the rule going uh, and then overnight that will alarm out when they come back in the morning, push the button again, turns off this rule so that it stops working again. Um, the one below it is is for the visitor alert. Um, what happens there is it plays a bell noise because what they've got computer in the corner and the people are busy working. So so what happens is it plays a bell noise out of those speakers. And, it, and there's a few little things we have to do to make that happen and again, they don't want those speakers because they've got them outside as well as on the computer. They don't want that bing bonging noise to be upsetting the neighbours. So we create a little inverse thing. So when they push that button, not only does it set the other alerts going for nighttime, it disables this one. So we can use some logic there. So yeah, that is uh, an example of how we can alert and make that alert useful. Uh, we can display messages on screens. We can start some live streams. So for example, if you guys have got a number of, of jobs all happening at once, it may be that um, you've just got one screen that's usually what, what you call the alarm screen. And basically when everything happens, it will then just pop up with it and make it visible to the user. Play a sound, always good for waking an operator up. And uh, been able to move a PTZ camera or something like that around as well. So for example, if you've got a really wide view static, um, and then maybe you've got a PTZ that's that's in that area as well and you want to zoom in on say a door then you can uh, as part of that make if, if you get an alert on your static camera make the PTZ camera move around and zoom into that door uh, and give us a, a better presence. So we're going to talk a little bit about post process analytics now. So it allows the following, which is the searching of, of, of much more detailed parameters that can be cross referenced. For example, a person walking in a certain direction, wearing certain colors of clothing. And also that searching of multiple sources of video to give indication of a person's objects or movement in a given time period. Many of the same principles apply with regards to the installation and setup of those cameras, that resolution, installation, height, till, light levels, etc. They're just as important with this as well. So we're going to have a look at a little demonstration video. Um, this is using a vigil on. Uh, we've got about two hours of footage in here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just set that running. Um, and from here. Yeah, so we've got about eight cameras. They're in an exhibition hall. It's a permanent exhibit as far as I'm aware. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to search. We're going to do appearances. We won't bother selecting any of the personal characteristics at this stage. We'll select someone who's wearing a pink top. Uh, we're going to make sure we've got a person. Yes, <laughs> no vehicles inside. 
Again, as I said, there's personal characteristics, but we're not going to use them for this. In terms of clothing, we're going to make sure they've got a pink top. We're not going to bother with lower body colour, but if you had more, uh, more things that you could look at, then uh, that's great too. We've got a date range, but in this case, we don't need to worry about that because this is the set, set of footage I've taken out. You can, of course, do this to live video. Uh, it, just for this demonstration, it was easier to take a, uh, a couple of hours of video off a recorder. And then we've got eight cameras, and we're just going to click that search button and let it do its thing. So it updates its results. And if we see our person, which we may do in this big list of thumbnails, what we can do is we can just, there we go, we can star that and what it will do is it will now place that at the top, use that as our profile at this stage and it will then provide me results that match as much as possible that criteria. From there, we can then start other results and add them to it. And it will update the results every time we do that. What we can also do to speed things up, if we've got lots of them like we have here, the, the quickest way of dealing with this is just to tick the, tick the thumbnails all in one go like this. So this means it's just a little bit quicker. And then we can click star at the bottom there and it will add all of those all at once. So I just speed that up a little bit. So as we can see, it adds all of those starred thumbnails onto our timeline at the bottom. So we can see what's happening. And we can also have a look at those on the uh, individual cameras down at the bottom there that I'm just highlighting. And we get an idea of where the person is and where they've been over time. I just had a few more here. I don't go berserk and add lots because there's not really any point, but in this case, but uh, he just adds a few more to the timeline. Once that's been done, we can then do things such as uh, play them back. We can, uh, so if I just click on one, there we go. We could also click the little uh, zoom button and what it does is it actually zooms the image there on the right hand side into where the person is uh, and we can play these back. And we can also do things such as bookmark them so they appear on your live video so you can go back and look at that and maybe export all that later or you can actually um yeah it's just me zooming in again um and we can also uh i just yeah there we go <laughs> you can jump to them on the timeline as well which makes things a bit quicker and you can also add them to export so you can export them all from here as well as bookmarking into your video. So we're going to have a look at some post process analytics from uh, from Milestone or within Milestone. Um, this is called Rapid Review um, and it's, it's basically a bolt on into Milestone. Uh, it can connect directly to your recorders, analyzing and marking that video with metadata. Um, it does that as part of processing, so it, it looks at the video, it takes it, and adds all that metadata to do it. Uh, and what we're going to look at is how we can pick out different details uh, about where and when a person Let's show you how. was seen. Let's assume you have already picked the related cameras in the time frame of your search. Then you apply the specific search criteria to narrow down your search and find exactly what you're looking for. For this exercise, we want to find a child. wearing red upperwear
and who is below six feet tall. As you can see, the system instantly presents the search results, narrowing down the list from more than 3,000 to only 14. Based on an advanced multi-camera search, the results from all pre-selected cameras display in the center of the screen, allowing you to look thoroughly at the results one by one. If you want to speed up your investigation even further, you can take advantage of the unique video synopsis technology. On the left side of the pane, you find the search results per camera. Hitting the playback button presents all matching objects that have appeared at different times in the video simultaneously. This allows you to review hours of video in minutes and sometimes even seconds. Anyone who has tried to search and sort through hours and hours of recordings to find what is needed knows how cumbersome it can be. So that is showing how uh, how that can uh, really speed up um, how quickly you can get to the bottom of what was going on, where somebody was, what was happening, that kind of thing. I think the synopsis is a fantastic thing. It really, when people first see that, I think they uh, they're always quite surprised by it. Um, I'm going to leave that one. That's a very similar one, but with a vehicle. Um, this one here, I'm just going to show you a couple of short ones now. So this one here is looking at more advanced te techniques that can be employed, such as uh, drawing an arrow so what we're looking for here is is uh, people making illegal u-turns so we make an arrow we can look at our accuracy well because we've drawn the arrow we'll make it fairly fairly generic at this point we don't need to be too accurate and it'll play back it'll show me all the instances of anything that made that movement so we can see here this vehicle and oh, almost crashes into somebody which isn't brilliant and also we can see all the different instances of that. If we wish, we can also go into the class and choose different types of vehicles. So maybe we're only interested in a van that made a U-turn. And then it will present us with that information. And then we've got just cars. Again, we could have searched for different types of cars, different colors of cars, sorry, not types. So this is uh, an example of, of facial recognition. So in this example, we've got nearly 2000 faces that it's identified. Uh, we can import lists uh, as well to help with the searching. So, for example, you can get you may be able to get things from like Facebook and other types of places, import them into here, and then it will do a similarity search against that. In this case, we're just going to search from the already identified faces within this piece of footage here. And we're going to click on this person. It uses not only faces, but it uses lots of other things such as height, walking gait as well. So it uses lots of different parameters to uh, to look for similarities when it comes to doing similarity search, what we've just done here, uh, against the moving video. And we can get from 2000 down to 36 instances of that person in that space or in on, on those three or four cameras, four cameras. Again, you can play them back. We can save them, export them, all that kind of thing as well. And we can package those up ready for export. So we have, if we have a look at analytics specifically for, for surveillance, so we've talked about different types, some of them may be more uh, appropriate than others. Um, you know, for you guys, been alerted when people are coming and going from buildings and driveways and other sorts of things. That's where those live analytics work really well. Um, and even if it's just a case of, you know, you're not you're not going to uh, you're still going to have people there viewing it or being able to alert just to you know prick their ears up that something is happening uh, and maybe also being able to for that to help you document it instead of writing it down in books and things it can be bookmarked automatically for you so you can go back quicker and go and find it later um, and also 
how to un understand how often people and vehicles are at, at buildings uh, and, and in different spaces. Um, you can see there on the right, I've got two things. One of them is a heat map, um, which shows there a, a big chunk of red further up at the top there. So that might indicate that, say, a driveway gets used more than one would expect. A certain road gets used more than you'd expect. Um, and the one below is the common paths. So uh, I know this has been used and there's a video around somewhere which I've not got in here, which is, uh, you know, everything on the street looked normal and the video was actually being used for something entirely different. But they saw a huge amount of red going between two houses and when they realised they were both used as uh, as drug dens. So it, it immediately gave them information that they really wouldn't have seen otherwise. Um, so, yeah, in terms of that monitoring of people and objects, you know, how often are those people leaving and entering a bank team? When did they leave? When did their vehicle leave? All those things you can get to a lot quicker using these these kind of techniques. So I'm going to go through two very quickly because I know I'm running out of time. Uh, two things that uh, that we've done for two separate clients. This one here, this is Operation Protector. Uh, maybe some of you know about that. Maybe some of you don't. That was last year. Last year? Gosh, yes, I think he was. Um, for the party party conferences. This was uh, the one in Manchester. Um, the requirement here was 37 cameras that surround the entire building and a couple inside in various bits and pieces inside key building areas and things like that. Um, and following a survey that we did with with the place, uh, we identified a couple of key areas that couldn't be secured inside the fence. Look at the image there on the on the right hand side rather luckily. Actually has the barriers, so this must have been taken by our friends at Google at some point <laughs> before that event uh, because it has got the barriers around it. But um, you can see there just on the uh, there's a red line and that's showing, you know, there's a block of flats there and we no fence could be put up there so they couldn't isolate that block of flats from the site. Um, so if people could climb out of the lower floor windows and the ground floor windows and, and basically into that secure area. So our solution was uh, basically down at the bottom there where that black blob is, we had already had a um, temporary tower, a trailer cam system where we had already had PTZ cameras. We put in a five megapixel static, aimed up that pathway. And what we did is we created two sterile zones, one on the left, one on the right. Um, and what we did on the one on the right is we also added a virtual tripwire, a bit like the image below um, with arrows going downwards. So if people were to either come down a ladder or come out of a window downwards, then we would be able to get an alert should that happen. Now the same was actually the same for the for the other end of the uh, of that little corridor as well. So we did a very similar thing with a camera up at the top there and did it the opposite way. Um, so day to day, people, officers on patrol, all the rest of it coming down there because they were the only people who were using that space. Uh, no problems at all. But if anybody went into that space at all, then in the op centre, they they got an alert in Milestone that told them that something was happening and made them aware. Another one very briefly is one of our council clients, um, which is Worcester. So this is a map of Worcester and you can see a huge dotting of cameras everywhere. Um, they already had PTZs. We did a full refresh of the system at the same time. We obviously replaced their PTZs, but also we put in up a lot of these 360 cameras that I showed you an image of earlier. Um, and what we did with those 360 cameras and 270s as well with three cameras in is we basically switched on the analytics all you do with that is switch it on, tell it it's going to be doing it. It will learn the place and learn its areas. And then after that, uh, it will start generating that metadata uh, and we can do lots of learning with them and that type of thing. And that allows them in their uh, operations room in Worcester to be able to do searches against people, uh, missing persons, all sorts of things. Um, so that's something we did in the last here, um, 68 camera locations, but actually totally about 120 cameras in total, of which all of the statics like that one are doing that advanced analytics in a vigilant in this case. So quick summary, it can save you time in critical situations. Um, it can also give operators a situation awareness they just simply never had before. Post-process analytics that can streamline the amount of time it takes to process really huge amounts of video from multiple sources. Um, and you can effectively set it going, schedule it overnight, come in in the morning, and then it's ready for you to analyze and check. Um, it can also streamline directly into video management systems as well. So yeah, you can uh, 
you can speak to us about that and we can work with you on on how we can bring this directly into your milestone installations that some of you already have. So with that, we'll move on to a Q&A if anybody has any questions. Thank you very much, Michael, for um, talking us through all of that. Um, okay. Yeah, like, like Michael said, there's there's a bit of time for Q&A. Um, I mm. realise we have overrun a little bit, but there's, there's so much to cram into this topic. There is. It's a very big, wide subject. Yeah, definitely. So if people have specific needs, then yeah, come and talk to us. Uh, and we Absolutely. Can... Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we'll be sending out the recording of this um, webinar as well later today. So if you do think of any questions kind of after the after the um, event or if you've talked to someone else afterwards and, and think of a situation where this might be of benefit to you, then please do just simply reply to that email and we'll make sure someone gets in touch to talk through your individual requirement. Definitely. Um, thank you very much, Michael. Um, if you would like to attend our next um, law enforcement briefing, that will be in September, the next quarter. And that will be on the 29th of September. So you can either sign up um, using the link on the Bedrock website or be sending an email about that as well. So you can you can secure your place nice and early and we'll be um, letting you know further information about what the uh, contents of that one closer to the time. Um, oh, I believe Cara has actually also posted the um, sign up link in the comments box for you as well. So if you do want to attend that one and secure your place now, please just uh, fill in that form like you did to attend this one and we'll make sure you're the first to hear about it. Okay, um, so we're a little bit over time, so we will say goodbye for now. Thank you very much everyone for joining us. Really good to see so many of you um, here today. Thank you again, Michael, and we hope to see you again in September. Thanks everyone.